rights as human rights with a specific focus on uh, the situation of Afghanistan right now. So we have with us today Ms. Nargis Nehan, and we are um, extremely grateful uh, that she has uh, accepted our invitation. And it's an honor for us uh, that she's here with us uh, today. So uh, of course, I would like to start uh, with uh, um, the introduction of Ms. Nargis Nehan. She, uh, she was born in Afghanistan, and in 1980s, she had to leave Afghanistan uh, during the war. And she came, uh, her family left Kabul, and she came to Pakistan. During her time in pa at Pakistan, she worked with different non-governmental organizations, and she completed a mar um, master's in finance. She, uh, uh, in 2001, when um, United States invaded Afghanistan, she went back to Afghanistan and started working with Norwegian Refugee Council. Um, after she left working with the Norwegian Refugee Council, she took a series of positions with Afghan Interim administra Administration. Her government positions have included Director General of the Treasury Department at the Ministry of Finance, Vice Chancellor for Administration and Finance at Kabul University, and Senior Administrative Advisory Position to the Minister of Education and Higher Education. And uh, she, 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 well, in 2017, she was the acting minister for mines, petroleum, and industries in Afghanistan. She is also a women's rights activist, and she has a uh, found, she's founder of of organization known as Equality for Peace and Democracy, an organization whose mission is to empower women and youth to become active decision makers by electing their leaders and representatives through voting, monitoring state institutions' performance and holding them accountable for public policies and resources, and also becoming agents of change in their community and daily life. She is also a member of the Civil Society's Joint Working Group, the Afghan Coalition for Transparency and Accountability. In 2021, she had to leave Afghanistan after the fall of the government of President Ashraf Ghani, and she's currently in Norway. Uh, welcome to the uh, Global Institute of Law, Ms. Nehan. And I would like to um, ask you to explain a bit about the current situation in Afghanistan, what is happening right now, and uh, how do you want to explain? Uh, well, thank you very much, Noor. Now, first of all, I have to uh, express my gratitude to the, the Global Institute of Law for arranging today's session, uh, the platform that I can communicate about uh, the situation in my country, uh, the situation of women, and minorities, and how uh, uh, what is happening in Afghanistan today, how is it linked uh, in the bigger context with the rest of the world, and how uh, that is going to have its own impact on the rest of the world. Uh, so as I'm sure whenever you're hearing about Afghanistan, uh, you must be hearing about uh, conflict, rampant corruption, impunity, weak governance, lack of rule of law, uh, 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 civilian casualty, uh, military casualty, international forces casualty. So this, these are all the news, the, the very negative news that, that despite the, um, the progress that we have made, have been always hitting in the international media and that's what has been the focus on news on Afghanistan in the last 20 years. While many times we try to change that and shape different and promote different and positive narrative about Afghanistan, uh, but that has been very difficult. Uh, and we believe that this negative, imaging uh, news about the me, uh, the, uh, the uh, about Afghanistan has created a fatigue among all countries about Afghanistan, because especially the citizens of and the taxpayers of different countries uh, kept. He felt that if we are supporting so much that country, why we don't see any changes in that country? Why things are not improving in that country? That constantly we are hearing about war, conflict, and atrocities. Um, today, I want to share with you some of the progress that we have made in the last 20 years, especially with regard to women's access, women's rights, and women's mobility, and women's agency that uh, we didn't have it before. Uh, so, for example, girls' enrollment in school increased to 40%, uh, literally from zero that we had it during Taliban time or during the civil war. Uh, girls' enrollment to universities increased to 5% from zero. 22% uh, of women had jobs in public, private, and non-governmental sectors, 
and um, a woman formed 30%, 30, more than 30% of civil servants. More than 50% of our teachers were female, and 27% of our parliamentarians were women. More than 3,500 women owned small to medium scale businesses, where besides running the businesses themselves, they also created employment for many other women and men. And women served as ministers, ambassadors, advisors, deputy ministers in different positions in the public sector. They also led many civil society organizations in the non-governmental sectors, besides, and they were also running many uh, media outlets uh, in Afghanistan. And all laws and legislations that Afghanistan was drafting in the last 20 years, the law, all, they treated women, men and women as equal citizens, and they didn't impose any restriction or any discriminatory policy against the woman. And millions of people became aware about women's rights, minorities' rights, equal rights, the importance of freedom of speech and democracy through different programs that uh, civil society organizations were conducting and as well as media. And uh, Afghanistan had uh, one of the most independent and vibrant uh, media uh, in the South Asia, according to many reports that we had. So Afghanistan was uh, not a lost case. Afghanistan was not a failed project that unfortunately most of the time it was being portrayed by mainly the media. Uh, about the case in Afghanistan. We as a society have changed, have changed a lot. Uh, and uh, as a society, we have transformed a lot. Uh, the country for the first time had begun to bring uh, itself together. We had public institutions providing services to the people. And for the first time, Afghan people in the country began to feel that they have a government that's taking the responsibility, that is asking about them, that is taking care of them. Of course, it was not perfect and we had a lot of corruption, impunity, as I mentioned, we government. But despite all those weaknesses, we also had progress. So it was not that you know, we had no progress. There was a lot of progress. So I keep on telling everybody that if you're looking at Afghanistan case from our politicians' perspective, from the leaders' perspective, um, then of course Afghanistan looks uh, uh, not only a failed uh, state to you, but it also looks a failed cause to us as well, the Afghans. But if you're looking at Afghanistan from the women's movement perspective, from the civil society's uh, development perspective, from the media perspective, from the young generation's engagement and awareness perspective, then definitely Afghanistan was not a lost case. And the return that we have got from the all the investment that we made in Afghanistan, especially on the civilian activities, the return is much more higher than all of us expected. I'm sure um, none of us could imagine standing in front of Taliban, uh, who was actually having uh, their, their, their guns towards us and talking about our rights. None of us would dare to do that. But I'm sure you saw in the media that as soon as Taliban forced women that they should not go out and they should not, uh, they cannot go and return back to their work within two weeks weeks, very, uh, a small, a, a great number of women organized themselves and they went out uh, on the streets, they had the demonstration, and that was at a time that the Taliban was warning them to shoot them, and in many cases we know that they were being shot by the Taliban, we also lost many, some of these women that they organized the demonstration. That shows the level of awareness of the people, that they are ready to sacrifice their right, but they're not ready to sacrifice and compromise their rights anymore. So that is the Afghanistan that we have before 15 August. Unfortunately, after uh, 15 August, because of the very rash uh, peace process uh, that we had, and because of the very uncomprehensive and irresponsible um, peace deal that was signed by the US with the Taliban, and then very irresponsible withdrawal that we had uh, by the US announced and later on followed by the uh, all other NATO members, uh, we saw that uh, that provided, and then uh, sudden uh, escape and, uh, of the president uh, with, uh, with his uh, close allies, and that created a power vacuum in, in Kabul and provided the opportunity for the Taliban to come and take Kabul. So within a few hours, we saw a huge change inside our country. And uh, within a few days, um, the thousands of women that they were going to uh, uh, to uh, to job, and uh, they were running businesses, they were running civil society organizations, media outlets. All of them were forced to sit at home, and uh, on top of that, uh, the girls were not allowed to go to school. Uh, Taliban introduced segregated uh, education for girls and boys, 
and uh, girl and, and woman female teachers were not allowed to go to school to schools and universities anymore so all the restrictions uh, were imposed uh, the way that we had it previously in Taliban's time and all the achievements that we had in the last 20 years unfortunately we just lost all of them in the blink of an eye because of the irresponsible withdrawal of youth from Afghanistan and the arrest of the NATO members and today while after 20 years of investment struggle and uh, and hard work that we have had once again we are talking about emergency situation in Afghanistan we are talking about women being forced to sit in their houses in Afghanistan. We are talking about high poverty in Afghanistan. And we are talking about women's rights and women's rights and minorities and all the atrocities that I'm sure you're hearing through media about Afghanistan. So um, you're saying that the last two decades were a progressive period in terms of women's rights in Afghanistan, right? Yes. This is what I wanted to ask you as well. So you answered my question already. So, um, so what, what is your opinion? There, there are a lot of women's rights act activists from Afghanistan who have told me that women, uh, that Afghan civilians, especially women, were kept out of the peace process. So do you think, what's your opinion on that? Uh, absolutely. Women were kept out of the peace process. Women were kept out of the main discussions and decisions which were made about Afghanistan. And it was not only women but also main, progressive uh, main that they were working in the civil society, in the media, any main and woman that they cared about, about Afghanistan and they were demanding responsible withdrawal, they were demanding um, a comprehensive and durable peace deal, they were kept out of the peace deal. So unfortunately, the Americans were mainly looking for uh, the people that would just say yes, and would support uh, the, the strategy that they had, uh, uh, had in mind for the peace deal in Afghanistan. They were not looking for a proper peace process, but they were just looking for production of a peace deal. And anybody that would help them to achieve that would have been their partner. Rest of the people, all of them were being ignored, but especially women, because if you review the history of women movement, uh, especially in the last 20 years in Afghanistan, all the time, women have been very much outspoken about corruption, about impunity, about the uh, lack of rule of law, about lack of responsibility, and have been constantly demanding uh, um, um, transparency on every issue and accountability from the Afghan governments and as well as from the international community. So as soon as the announcement came for the peace process to be initiated, women already put uh, some recommendations in place and they shared that with the Afghan government, and as well as with the international community and the woman demanded that we need to have an inclusive process in the process we need to have accountability we need to have a monitoring process mechanism in place to monitor what is happening during this process so all the questions that women kept on asking they had no answer for all of them and of course the only chance that they had was to sideline women ignore women and make sure that even the vocal women do not get at a, uh, invited to uh, different platforms inside of one and as well as outside of Afghanistan, including the peace deal, so that they don't get any opportunity to raise their voice. But despite all these restrictions that we have, despite all these ignoring the uh, uh, eliminations that they try to impose on women, uh, we managed to find different platforms. We most of the time created those platforms ourselves, and we constantly talk about uh, talked about the peace process, about the concerns that we had about the process. And what we are dealing today in Afghanistan, what we have witnessed in the last two months in Afghanistan, were all exactly what we kept on mentioning to both the uh, international community and as well as our leaders about our concerns with regard to the peace process. So you are saying that even during the last, uh, or during the presidency of uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Ashraf Ghani, women were not being uh, provided with the platforms to raise their concerns, and if you whatever you were doing was on your own, like it was your independent struggle, or were uh, the, was, was the government yeah. supportive of women? It was very different because in the beginning of the his government, um, his government was very much pro women's right, pro youth participation, pro pro good governance, pro economic prosperity, and pro uh, fighting corruption. That was in you know, the five main pillars that he kept on talking about it, and that's why during his first round of campaign, many of the people, including myself, we supported him and we believed in him because we thought that okay, he has 
good education background. He's coming from an academic background. He knows the international community. He has worked in different international organizations. And all of them together uh, have provided him with enough knowledge and information to help us uh, shaping a new future for Afghanistan. So, and when he came in power, to be fair to him, he did try to do that in terms of forming uh, his cabinet, trying to bring a good number of women, appointing women as uh, minister, deputy ministers, directors, uh, commissioners, advisors. Uh, so he did that. And the last, in the, in the first two to three years, that was the trend because he had a good number of um, credible people that they were around him. And all of them were advising him on different issues, whether we were talking about the economic situation, about the security, about uh, social, and about culture. On every issue, he had good a num uh, number of people that they were advising him, and all the time making sure that he's delivering on what he was promising to the people. Uh, what happened that the peace process started, and he was he received a lot of pressure from the international community side. On top of that, slowly and gradually, the circle that was around him that was always providing him with the right advice and support that he needed, slowly and gradually, that circle began to break. And most of the people were thrown out or they were forced to leave the government or they were being sidelined. They were they basically or they were actually they were sent away, appointed as ambassador and others. And a new group of people surrounded him. So this new group of people that they surrounded him, they had a very different uh, perspective for Afghanistan. Uh, first of all, most of them had come from abroad. They even could not speak our language. And secondly, they had very little information about Afghanistan. They were not rooted in the country, so they had no idea what was happening. And most of them had come with this idea of, okay, like for their own career uh, uh, plan rather than for the country. So their focus was how to develop themselves, how to make money, and how to make sure all the time that they stay close to the president. And uh, for that, they had to create different scenarios. And they had to... Uh, basically, like cut uh, ties of the president uh, from uh, the president Ghani at that time with the good people that he was connected. So that slowly and gradually isolated him, and he was surrounded by the wrong people, not with Afghanistan. And then, based on their advice, he came up with the policies which shocked all of us, to be honest to you, in the last few years that he was in power, in terms of um, very discriminative and racist policies and strategies that he adopted, very exclusive style of government that he adopted, and uh, very suppressive style of uh, govern uh, rule of law that he adopted. And uh, that literally brought people to the point that while everybody was frustrated and they didn't want the Taliban to come to get into power, they also lost all their motivation to support the Republic under his leadership. So now moving on to our next question. Uh, so uh, different human rights lawyers, including the former members of Afghan Human Rights Commission, have filed a petition that has been published on European Journal of International Law as well. And they, are, they have claimed systematic violence against women in Afghanistan, including killing the civilians, taking over of houses, house to house searches to find women activists, journalists and human rights defenders. So they're claiming enforced disappearances are rampant in Afghanistan right now, which is a crime against humanity under the International Convention of Protection of All Persons Against Enforced Disappearances. Uh, so what is your um, opinion regarding these speculations? Are the reports uh, credible? And what is being done by the international organization working on enforced disappearances? Is there any help being offered to these women, these journalists and human rights defenders? And what are your demands from the international community right now? Well, first of all, the, um, we, uh, the international community ha had to prepare for uh, evacuation of the, the people at risk months before, which they didn't do it. Uh, so suddenly when the Taliban captured Kabul, then they rushed into evacuation and we saw the situation in Kabul airport. While even in Kabul airport, we had a number of incidents uh, uh, quite tragic because of the rush that we had in Kabul airport. Uh, on top of that, um, uh, I found it honestly pretty sur uh, uh, surprising and, and also disappointing uh, with the policies that they had adopted in terms of evacuation of um, uh, their, 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 their local or national counterparts. So for example, the, the requirement was saying that you have to have some sort of engagement with them uh, one of the embassies, if you are expecting that country's uh, country to evacuate you, either you have to implement, you had implemented a project with them, 
or you had designed a project with them, you must have had some sort of relation and allies with them. So that based on that, you could say that, okay, my life is in danger and I need you to support me. So there was a small number of women inside Kabul that they were very well connected with almost all these embassies, including myself, where we received uh, calls from different embassies that uh, they were willing to help us with the evacuation. But then there was a huge number of uh, uh, activists and journalists and entrepreneurs that um, they were living in the provinces and they did not have that kind of connection with them, with the uh, with these embassies. For example, our office uh, we created women prevention women networks in 20 provinces of Afghanistan. So these networks have been uh, vocally working about women's rights, about women peace and security, about conflict resolution in the last eight to uh, nine years. And they have been very active. And uh, to be honest to you, their life are more in danger than this of us because they have gone out of their way in terms of trying to identify conflicts and try to resolve them. But they do not have any kind of direct link with any of the embassies or international organizations because first, they don't speak English. Secondly, they are located, located in the provinces. Third, it was our organization providing them with the fundraising and with project management with all those support that they require to do their job at the community level. So when I uh, when this whole situation happened, I prepared their list and I requested several embassies and I said we need your support for evacuation of these women. And I was receiving these questions from them that okay, like uh, well, with uh, in which project of your organization they were involved? Have we funded that project? Can you send us this evidence? Can you send us that evidence? So basically, they would evacuate a cop that was uh, that had a contract with an embassy they would evacuate a security guard that had contract a cleaner that had a contract but they would not evacuate a very vocal activist if he or she did not have any kind of direct link with their uh, with the embassy so as a result what happened that despite we uh, hear about thousands of people being evacuated in afghanistan we are also hearing about uh, hundreds of activists, journalists, and uh, judges that they're still inside the country. And it's just because of that lack of direct link that they have with these embassies. Okay. Thank you for answering the question. So uh, you are saying that people who were working independently as activists are at a greater danger because there was nobody to support them as embassies were only taking out people who were associated with them. Yeah, absolutely. In any manner. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So, so uh, while they, and then the other thing that uh, uh, I have to mention is that um, while a number of uh, activists got evacuated, but that's a very small number, mainly very well-known places that they had to evacuate them. And somehow many of them wanted to evacuate them to say, okay, like I evacuated this person. I like, uh, but then all of us, when we got evacuated from Afghanistan, uh, as soon as we got into these countries, we were put into in the list of uh, refugees that uh, we received as refugees. We were placed in camps as in refugees. Still, we are placed in different camps in different countries as refugees. While this is the prime time, prime time that we should be supported to raise our voice to talk about what is going on in the country. So while you have Afghan women sitting in refugee camps and waiting for their papers to be processed, waiting for their destiny to see in which very isolated uh, state of different countries they will be located, you see many international activists that they uh, come and they're talking about Afghan women's rights because you have a limited number of women that they have the enabling environment and the support they require that they raise their voice, they write about the situation, they talk about the situation. I found it very disappointing because literally no women's rights activists receive any kind of support from the host countries and they're just treated as another refugee that they have to go to camp. They have to be located in one of the very isolated states and they have to find their way out of that process themselves. I mean, if it was a normal situation that we, these, some of the activists with their own choice would have decided to leave Afghanistan, uh, they would have come to these countries, then fine, like you treat them as a refugee that will seek asylum and she has to, she or he has to find uh, uh, his, his or her way in the country. But you know, very, we, everybody knows very well that none of us were, was willing to 
leave our country, the situation forced us to leave in Afghanistan. We received support, a small number of us received support to get evacuated from Afghanistan, but as soon as we landed outside Afghanistan, we literally received no support being an activist to be able to continue our work. I'm going to ask you now. I'm going to ask you about the anticipated future of Afghan women under the Taliban rule. So, what are your expectations, uh, and are you hopeful that situation might change for better? And what are your demands from the government and also from the international community? How can they step in and help you out? Uh, Taliban had an opportunity that uh, to basically uh, turn the situation and prove. Uh, every one of us wrong and saying that no, we have really changed. And this is how, you know, this, this is what you see in action. So while despite all these disappointments that we had, there was an opportunity for ending the four decades of war that we had in Afghanistan, the four decades of conflict that we had in Afghanistan, and forming an inclusive government and ensuring people that, okay, whoever has left Afghanistan, they have left, the rest of you can continue their, your life and let's get together and build uh, Afghanistan. And Afghanistan is not an occupied country anymore, something that Taliban have been fighting and have been claiming for their fight. Uh, in the last 20 years. So they had that opportunity and it was very little for them to do to achieve that. All we, the, everybody was expecting to do was that first they form an inclusive government an inclusive government does not mean that like, they bring representative of their like-minded people from different ethnicities and say that, okay, this is an inclusive government. But even if they have done that, it would have been more acceptable with the international community because international community was very, uh, tired and exhausted with uh, uh, war in Afghanistan. And they were looking for some sort of arrangement that would just, they could have just showed to their media and to their own citizens saying, oh, like things are fine in Afghanistan. They can move on uh, independently on their own. So they could have formed like some sort of inclusive government by bringing representative of different ethnicities, even if they have problem with them. The previous leaders of these ethnicities, they could have brought the way that Dr. Ghani tried to do it. He brought young generations from uh, young and independent and more tech mostly technical and technical people from other ethnicities. And he said that, okay, it's an inclusive, but I'm not going to bring those, um, my oppositions from these ethnicities. So the, at least he could have tried that where he could have brought you techni uh, technocrats from Tajiks, from Hazaras, from, from, um, uh, from, from Uzbeks, and they could have said that, okay, it is an inclusive government. Look, we have representatives from all these ethnicities. And then on top of that, they should have brought few women. Fine, if they had problem with women of you know, like activists like myself, um, they could have brought more like traditional women that they are in Afghanistan, they are educated, they have lived here, and they said, okay, like these are the women that you're going to work with. I don't think any of them, any country, any international uh, member of international community would have rejected their government, would have said that, oh, we don't recognize you. And the other thing is that they should have been careful because they, they want to deal with the international community. They should be respectful to the international com uh, community's norms that is actually bringing all of us together and is binding us. So forming a, a cabinet where majority of the members of that are uh, in the in the in the blacklist of the uh and the sanction list itself shows that they have no respect for that. So unfortunately, by taking all these steps. Uh, they literally prove that they haven't changed. And uh, they literally, I believe that they somehow themselves left no room for the international community to recognize them. And then on top of that, uh, uh, besides not recognition, um, in terms of segregating girls and boys education, not allowing girls to go to school, not allowing women to go to their uh, offices anymore, by uh, suppressing those women that they organize demonstrations, by uh, committing atrocities in Panjshir and other provinces, by depopulation that they, uh, that they have done so far in Panjshir and Daikundi, and they're planning to do, they might be doing it in some other provinces especially north of Afghanistan as well. Uh, so by doing all these things, and, and, and they literally showed that like, their policy about women has not changed, their perspective about minorities has not changed, and their policies about you know, like Sharia law has not changed. They want to uh, implement the most regressive uh, um, uh, uh, form of the law in Afghanistan. And the best example was uh, 
uh, abolishing um, of the uh, Ministry of Women's Affairs and uh, restoration of the Ministry uh, the, of the Office of uh, Ministry of um, uh, Virtue uh, um, instead of that. So that was a very symbolic move to show that like what they believe in, and instead of like abolishing an institution that was supporting women and restoring an institution that's going to suppress women. So that itself speaks volumes about like their ideology uh, about them. So that is the situation. Afghanistan, unfortunately, right now is an isolated country. Once again, uh, Afghanistan is very much prone and is the very high risk of um, uh, civil war, proxy war, or any other form of war that you talk about it, because um, uh, Taliban are having fraction amongst themselves within the leadership. There are two branches that they don't get along. That's why it took them weeks to be able to form the government. Uh, there is no uh, cohesion between the leadership of the Taliban and their foot soldiers anymore. So I'm sure you must have heard that while the, uh, several times the leadership uh, announced general amnesty uh, for everyone, then their own foot soldiers and their local commanders are going after the former national security forces and they kill them and they in front of uh, cameras they say that we don't accept that amnesty so basically they don't respect what is decided and what's announced by the by leadership in Kabul beside that internal fragmentation that they have amongst themselves um, they are also uh, they literally forced women that they have to go to streets they have to demonstrate for their rights and women are going to continue to do that because the rights that women are demanding in Afghanistan are not the secondary rights. Those are the rights that will provide them with life and with bread and butter. Without those rights, women will not have food to eat because we are a power country in poverty. And all these women that they have been working beside feeding them themselves, most of them are also responsible for feeding their whole family. So by taking their jobs away from them, basically we have taken the income of an entire family from them. So this is going to be very difficult for them to accept that. And then beside uh, uh, the minorities, uh, while uh, people are have fatigue about war in Afghanistan because people are really tired, but if, if their houses are taken from them, if their houses are burned in front of them, if they are forced to leave their houses and their provinces move to another place, uh, and then they feel discriminated. And on top of that, uh, in, uh, in this whole situation, uh, there's also no hope for them. Uh, whether we like it or we don't like it, you will see that pockets of resistance are going to begin to take shape and form between the Taliban in different parts of Afghanistan, by the Tajiks, by Uzbeks, by Hazaras, and uh, they're going to organize themselves to be able to, uh, to demand, not demand, but actually fight for their rights, fight for, fight for that equal citizenship that we have been always fighting for. And on top of that, uh, Today, while we are talking, unfortunately, a few years back, we had a very uh, bloody uh, incident in Kandahar in one of the mosques that actually claimed many lives again. I don't know the exact number right now, uh, but that was once again ISIS attack on one of the um, mosques where uh, the Shia community from um, Kandahar province were attending the Friday prayers. So as you have seen in the last few days that the, the Daesh attacks have increased and that's, it's going to get even worse after this. Uh, and there are countries in the region that they're not happy uh, seeing Taliban in full power and they're not, uh, not uh, open to uh, any kind of collaboration with others, uh, those players inside the country. So those countries are going to come forward. They are going to support not only Daesh, they are going to support the resistance. They're support, going to support any uprising within Afghanistan, which is going to be against the, uh, the Taliban. So imagine a group that they have, don't have any expertise. They don't have any experience uh, of running a state and a very complicated state like Afghanistan that like, even very expert people are getting into the lost with. Like someone like Dr. Ghani who wrote Fixing Failed State Book, finally like he, he failed a state himself, but it was also because of complexity that Afghanistan has. So would, it, would they be able to deal their own, with, the, with their own internal challenges with the Daesh, with the resistance from different um, from different ethnicities, with the resistance from the uh, minorities, with the resistance from women, they have picked too many fights at a time that they are not, they are not they don't even they are not even able to actually put things together and normalize the situation in Kabul. So I'm uh, drawing a very picture for the future for us. Yeah. So in an earlier interview, as uh, you stated that you wanted, you were ready to go back and work in Afghanistan under the current government uh, if certain conditions were met. So now that you, 
you uh, the way you are saying that different groups are fighting amongst each other so you are say uh, so you believe that afghanistan is going to back to the time when there was civil war uh, going on between different group, uh, groups inside the country so do you think is there is still possibility of people who have left uh, who are of coming back do you still have any hope or you think you are entering a very dark phase afghanistan i mean and uh, i remember that interview that i gave but at that time taliban had not even announced their cabinet they had not come up with any kind of public policies about how they would treat women and how they would treat minorities they had not committed uh, atrocities that they later, later committed and punished and at and and i could be against the uh, minorities so at that time many of us my, our message was that if you really form a government that you want to serve people there are even people like us that we will come and help you as long as you respect citizens right you respect equality you respect a woman's right you respect human's right uh, so we will come and you'll forget what happened uh, uh, what you did in the in the uh, in past with the country with all of us but just to help the country move forward we are willing to come and help you out in any way that we could that could be in any capacity it doesn't have to be in like being member of the cabinet uh, but then later on we saw what happened uh, i mentioned to you about the everything that they have been doing uh, killing women targeting women uh, forcing women to stay at home taking all their basic rights from them the minorities everything so in light of all of that uh, there is no way that any of the people that they have left of honestan even those that they are outside of honestan they would even dare to go and 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 work with them or have any kind of collaboration uh, uh, with them and, uh, and unfortunately as i said the situation that i see this it's very complicated uh, and we see that despite the all the um, pressure that international community is putting on the taliban still the taliban are not responding uh, positively to that and um, and at least the indicators that we have right now at this stage because the situation of honestan is changing very rapidly the situation that we have right now the scenario that is painting ahead of us we don't know how long would it take to get there but it's definitely a chaos a crisis um and and and, and uh, as i said in like um, civil war really proxy war any form of war that you see is going to begin to take shape in in, in Afghanistan uh but then nevertheless you don't know what will happen in a few weeks uh, Taliban might change their policy Taliban might become inclusive or uh, there might be some sort of um, political settlement between the Taliban and other uh, politicians from other ethnicities so the in a, the situation that we have right now we don't see any way out of this but unfortunately crisis and and chaos um but as as muslims uh, we also have to be optimistic because in you know, a things do not happen always the way that we see it there are also many drivers and many factors hidden that we don't see them and sometimes they play the most in like um, uh, uh important role and stronger role than than the, those factors that we see and which are visible to us thank you and hopefully things will change for better and now i would like to ask you if you have any advice for human rights activists around the world who would like to help afghan people and especially afghan women in any possible manner so what is your like advice to them what should they do right now what's the uh, first of all i think uh, working together with afghan women is very much important um uh, i saw that since the situation of afghanistan there are many um um uh, platforms that they organize programs where actually uh, our international colleagues and regional colleagues uh, they allow themselves to come and speak for afghan women uh, which uh, which is appreciated but in the meantime i think it's also uh, um demonstrating a weaker image of afghan women which we are not Uh, so i think to by working together with afghan women and providing the opportunity for afghan women to be their voice themselves basically they are enabling us and they are helping us out to raise our voice and to show who we are and what are our capacities and what are our demands what we see inside the country and what what we think should be done about them so i think working with us is important instead of working for us uh talking together with us is important instead of talking on behalf of us um and uh, uh, advocating to their governments together with us for um, for uh, engaging constructively with the taliban uh, for changing their policy and trying to find ways that uh, they begin to revise and uh, and and relook at their 
policies and, uh, and strategy with regard to uh, dealing with the women, with the human rights, with the media, with the civil society, and as well as with the minorities inside Afghanistan. Uh, putting condition, giving condition support to the Taliban for allowing activities of human rights organizations, women's rights organizations inside the country is very much important. Women agency is something that we have invested a lot in the last 20 years. So for example, what we see in the last uh, two months have, is happening that a number of international organizations have, are expanding their offices um, in Afghanistan, while a huge number of national organizations are getting closed. And, um, and I keep on saying, I say Afghanistan is a strange country. Right now, it is much more secure for internationals than nationals. Uh, so I think that strategy needs to change because we have to respect the local agency, especially women's agen uh, women agency, and uh, providing humanitarian support to the Afghan citizens, and as well as rebuilding any construction of uh, Afghanistan or about human rights that we're talking about. And on top of that, all those women's rights activists that they are being evacuated to different countries, whether we are talking about Norway, US, and other country, we need support of our international allies, women's rights organizations, human rights organizations, in the end, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of these countries that beside evacuating us, they also help us and support us and provide us with an enabling environment and support so that we can continue our activism. We don't want them to turn us into another refugee and just force us to sit in the camps. Because if I'm sitting in the camp in, in Qatar and in, in Albania or in any other country with no access and support to be able to continue my activity, then I would rather stay inside Afghanistan and would have been sitting at home because I don't see any difference between myself and all those women that they are sitting at home. Uh, the only difference is that I'm provided with physical uh, uh, security by being evacuated from Afghanistan and they don't have that support. Other than that, there is no difference between them. They are as, de they are as deactivated as they are deactivated. So um, do you have anything to uh, say to the regional powers in terms of refugee intake? Like what role they have played so far and what should they be doing right now? Doing uh, sorry, I, can you repeat the question? I didn't get so, so your demand from the regional powers re regarding the refugee crisis in Afghanistan yes. right now. Yeah, so. yeah so first of all, what happened in Afghanistan was totally preventable if the regional countries would have cooperated, if they would have left their differences and their own politics aside and they would have focused on Afghanistan, not only for sake of Afghanistan, but for sake of themselves and their own countries. They didn't do that. They continued to bring all their differences inside Afghanistan and fight it there. And now that the country is in crisis, all of them are shutting their doors and they're saying, oh, we are not receiving refugee. If you really didn't want to receive refugee, then you shouldn't have brought Afghanistan to the situation that it is today. Uh, so, uh, I mean, if you're expecting Western countries that they support and they receive refugees from uh, Afghanistan, then how come Islamic and regional countries are not doing that? Um, we, they need to step in and they need to provide that support. And, and it's not that they're providing that support free of charge. Unlike Western countries, we have the experience. I have been uh, a refugee myself to Pakistan, and I have seen that as soon as we got there, it was no penny came to us from the government of Pakistan or from government of Iran or India or, uh, or Turkey and others. It was all the, the Western countries that through UNHCR, WFP and different international organizations, they provided us with the food, with the shelter, with, with everything, with school, with clinic, everything. So they are just providing us a piece of land to be there. Other than that, we know very well that all other support that, that refugees require are coming from international organizations with no penny from these countries. So they are doing very less. And, and, and only uh, lending a piece of their land, which in return, they get a lot of money. Uh, I think is nothing in this situation that they are doing to the Afghan people, and as well as uh, playing their own part in the, of responsibility uh, globally with, uh, while everyone is trying to help Afghanistan. Especially that what the situation that we have, the Taliban, if we have them in power, we know very well that it's all because of the regional countries, uh, mainly that they supported them. So thank you so much for joining us today. Is there anything else you would like to talk about uh, before we end the session? Uh, you can just discuss it with us. Uh, 
Well, I have to first of all thank uh, the Global Institute of Law uh, for arranging this uh, uh, program. And I also have to thank you for uh, this program and staying in contact, communicating with me. Uh, 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 it's an honor for us. Uh, and the pleasure in the last few days before this program. And my message to the rest of the, to whoever is uh, watching this program is that whatever is happening in Afghanistan today is not a battle between Afghan women and the Taliban or a moderate group of uh, uh, citizens uh, against the Taliban. It's basically a battle of two ideologies. One is the ideology where peace, which is peace, which believes in human's right and women's right and equality and justice and freedom of speech and freedom of humanity. On the other hand, the, the other ideology is about suppression, about uh, crime, about killing, and, uh, and, and, and about extremism. So we are, we are these fight, the fight that's happening in Afghanistan today, these fights are also happening in some other countries as well. If we constructively engage and support Afghan women and any other citizen, men and women, that they're fighting for freedom, they're fighting for moderation and liberation, they should be supported. We are not supporting that country, citizens of that country. We are supporting this ideology. So by supporting Afghan women, by supporting the resistance in Afghanistan, they're supporting the value that all of us have been working for it and have been struggling for it for many, many decades and actually centuries. So if that is this ideology managed to prevail and achieve in Afghanistan, this is going to set a precedent and a model for all other countries that this is going to be the ideology that we all have to fight for and this has to prevail. But if this ideology is not going to have victory and extreme Extremism will have a victory, then we should be ready for the ideology of extremism, suppression that is going to soon expand to other countries such as Pakistan, India, Bangladesh, and other countries. And slowly and gradually, they will also find their ways to Western countries. So what is happening in the context of Afghanistan will not be made in Afghanistan. It is the beginning of that is going to be in Afghanistan. Soon that's going to expand it to other countries and as well as the whole world. So that's why the this is a war that all of us together should fight it. And it's not only our war, it is on our side, but it's a, a war between the two ideologies that is happening around the world. So with this, we would like to end the discussion. Thank you so much for joining us and thank you so much for whatever you're doing for women in Afghanistan. Thank you for your activism. And it was an honor having you here with us and we will stay in touch with you in future as well. And we know that you have a busy schedule. So thank you so much for taking our time with us. Noor, thank you very much for all uh, very good questions that you have posed and for this event that you have put together from Abbasi for providing us all the technical support. And, uh, and let's continue our struggle as, as partners and collaborators and allies uh, for what we believe in. And, and we are, the number is quite huge and I'm sure that together uh, we can move mountains and it's going to be nothing for us. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good day.